Dr. Jocelyn, thank you so much for that introduction. And uh, thank you for so many of you coming out here tonight to hear me. <laughs> there are far better things to do on a Wednesday night in Banner Elk, I assure you. Very much for that. And uh, it's an honor to see so many of you here. Obviously, the ladies from the New Opportunity School for Women, it's a pleasure to see you. Uh, my boss is here. Two of my cabinet colleagues are here. Lots of our colleagues on the faculty are here. Gosh, I hope I don't disappoint as I, uh, as I talk to you all tonight. So Michael reached out to me, well, I guess it was probably in March as we were into the transition and, and uh, working through the transition, and he asked me if I would come and speak to uh, the, the students in the New Opportunity School for Women. And I obviously said, I'm, I'm thrilled to do that. Thank you for the invitation. It wasn't until I got here a couple weeks ago that Michael told me he was going to be putting out a press release and that this actually was branded as part of the Stevenson lecture, and I thought, gosh, I don't know that I'm up for that. <laughs> um, because my heart is with the ladies in the New Opportunity School for Women, and um, while I'm thrilled that many of you are going to hear the things I say tonight, the comments and my focuses are going to be toward them and, uh, and the, the, the story that I tell. I, you'll see uh, already that I'm an emotional guy. And um, I'm going to tell you some personal stories tonight of my life. Sorry. <laughs> if I get it out now, you won't have to, to listen to me later. Anyway, okay, enough of that. <clears throat> I am a, uh, I'm a very emotional guy. And I wear my emotions on my sleeve, and uh, I cry easily, and um, that's just part of how the good Lord in heaven made me, and uh, I hope you'll appreciate the conversations and things that we have tonight. But I'm going to tell you, when Michael asked me what it is that I'm going to talk about tonight, and he made me give a title to the lecture, and I thought, wow, I don't, I don't know that I could typically title this, but I wanted to talk about the transforming power of education, and the role that education has in literally changing life. And I want to share with you a very, very important story using my, my father, my relationship with my dad, and then the opportunities that I was given um, to be able to, to be in the place that I'm standing here before you tonight. Um, I'm a storyteller, so I'm, I don't have a written lecture. I've got just a quick outline of things that I want to share with you tonight. And I figured that it would be best to tell this from the perspective of a story. Um, and tonight's story is about a father and a son and a power of opportunity. My dad was one of ten children. Gosh, I didn't expect I'd get this emotional. I, I really, really apologize for this. Okay. Sorry. My dad was one of ten children. Grew up dirt poor in a little community called Clifton Forge, Virginia. Clifton Forge is a mountain community very similar to Manor Elk. If you've ever been in uh, the coal mining country of West Virginia, Clifton Forge is very close. And Clifton was a railroad hub for the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad. Both of my grandparents were railroaders. My grandfather was a pipe fitter on steam engines in the CNO shops in Clifton Forge. And that was my maternal grandfather. My dad's father, um, this is a guy that raised 10 children, his job was greasing the, uh, the axle shafts on train cars in the yard in Clifton Forge. And in raising 10 children on what you can imagine would be a railroader's salary at that time was very, very difficult. And there was no thought in any way that any of those 10 children would ever have the opportunity to go to college, ever have the opportunity to do um, what we call higher, higher jobs in the world. Um, they were destined to a life of either moving to West Virginia and working in the coal mine, going to Covington and working in the paper mill, or following in father after father's footsteps or working on the railroad. My dad won a public speaking contest when he was in, uh, in high school. And at that time, he felt the strong calling to the ministry, that he wanted to be a, a Baptist minister. But of course, as you can imagine, being the youngest of 10 kids in a family with a railroader, there was no opportunity that he had to be able to go to school. And the church that we grew up in, that he was a longtime member of, Clifton Forge Baptist Church, offered to pay for him to go to seminary, to go to college, to go to seminary. 
And dad said, I can't live the rest of my life being beholden to other people who helped me go through college, seminary, and other things. So he turned down that opportunity. And he went to work as a bookkeeper at the First National Bank in Clifton Forest, Virginia. Shortly after he went to work as a bookkeeper, his, he was drafted in the Army in Korea and went off to Korea and uh, was a member of the 101st Airborne Division. And instead of uh, being on the front lines in Korea, there was a, uh, an officer from his unit went through the ranks one day and said, does anyone here know how to type? And after having been a bookkeeper in the, um, been a bookkeeper at the First National Bank, Dad knew how to type, and he raised his hand and he got to spend the rest of the, the Korean War as the personal secretary to a general. He got a, you know, he, he was not out of the front lines and, and certainly freezing to death like many other U.S. soldiers did during the time. But Dad returned home, married my mother and started his job again at the First National Bank with a dream that one day he would like to be the president of the bank. And he firmly believed through that time, he came through a generation that you can achieve the things you want to do by hard work, by uh, grit and determination, being a good citizen and helping out. And he fit all of those molds. He was um, involved in virtually every community organization that you could possibly think of. He was captain of the rescue squad. He was, uh, I used to say, he ended up eventually being the mayor of the town that we lived in. Um, and I used to say that he had all the animal organizations covered because he was a lion, a moose, an elk, <laughs> um, and, and all of those, those wonderful, Kiwanis, Rotary Club, you name it, he was involved in one of those things. And it took him away from home a lot to, to where virtually every night of the week he was involved in one of those community activities. But my dad had a dream that he would, through sheer grit, and determination and hard work that he could eventually be the president of the First National Bank, the little tiny bank in Clifton Forge where we live. And when that opportunity arose, when he had worked at the bank for 35 years, that opportunity arose, and I'll tell you this is a powerful moment in my life, I'll never, never forget this moment. It was the only time that I ever saw my father cry. This is when he pulled me into his bedroom one morning as I was getting ready to go to school. And he said, son, I want you to know I was not elected president of the bank, and here's why. I don't have an education. And he felt betrayed because of the guys that he had worked with, that he had helped put on the bank board of directors, that he had helped invest and give loans to their businesses and other things were the same group of people that said at the end, Herbie, you're great. You're wonderful. We love the work that you've done. But we're going to have to give you a different title, and you can be in charge of the bank's day-to-day -day operations, but you can't have a title of president because you don't have a formal education. And as you can imagine, he was devastated. And the words that he said to me that morning when he told me what had happened the previous day at the bank board meeting, and I was an eighth grader. Didn't know anything about the fact that you know the, the time may be up for dad to be able to have that opportunity. His final words to me were, he said, son, I didn't have an education. And I want you to know that I'm gonna do everything in my power to make sure that you have one, so that you have opportunity that I never have. Now, excuse me for a minute. It's important to know the eighth grade me in this conversation. <laughs> My wife can't always laugh. I know the eighth grade It's important to know the eighth grade me because if you had known the eighth grade me, you would have been willing to bet all your money in your pocketbook that the eighth grade me would never be right here as the president of Lee's McCray College. The eighth grade me was a complete screw up. And I had every reason to be a screw up. I had a seventh grade principal tell my parents, Lee King is not smart enough to go to college. That's the same principal that had put me in her gifted and talented program the year before. So you wonder, you know, what do you think? <laughs> You're late. But for me, it wasn't cool to be smart. 
It wasn't cool to be gifted. I didn't want to be put into that particular program because none of my friends were there. It was not a cool place to be. So I sort of intentionally failed. My sister and her husband at that time in seventh grade had given me a black t-shirt that said eighth grade or bust on it. It was my birthday present <laughs> from them. And um, I'm convinced that my dad knew that I had incredible talent, was truly gifted in many, many ways. But I needed something to help me realize the opportunities that I was going to be given. A year later, my dad died. Passed away. He had had multiple heart attacks. He had his first heart attack when he was 40. And he died of an aortal aneurysm when I was in the ninth grade. So you can imagine my world was pretty, pretty tumultuous and shocked. But his promise to me came true because my dad was a very strong believer in life insurance. Now, I'm not here tonight to be a life insurance salesman. <laughs> But he left us all the resources that we need for my mother to educate me and to, do the, and to help me achieve the education that he never had. And my mother made a very brave decision. My dad died in January. I think it was probably April. My father, um, mom said, there's a, there's a package on your bed for you, son. I want you to go look at it. April was my birthday month. I thought, great, some birthday presents are coming early. I'm going to go check that out. And it was a package from Hargrave Military Academy in Chatham, Virginia. And uh, my mother said, sir, I've got an appointment for you next week. I said, gosh, they threatened the military school <laughs> for a long time. The old lady is, going, is really going to make this happen. So we go and visit. And initially, my mother wanted me to go just for the summer to take a how to study class and to uh, learn how to study because she thought my, my grade problem was the fact that I didn't know how to study. I knew how to study. I just didn't apply myself or really want to put forth the effort to do that. And after visiting Hargrave, my mother um, and I talked about it, and I said, Mom, I really don't want to go just for the summer. If I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this full board. I'm going to do it all out. I want to go and be a full-time student. And that opportunity, I want to keep coming back to the word opportunity, that opportunity and seizing that opportunity literally changed my life. Because in seventh grade, I had a principal that said, Lee's not smart enough to go to college. Tenth grade, I had a wonderful English teacher who pulled me and my mother aside and said, Lee is really, really smart, and he's a darn good student. Words could make a major impact on us. So from that moment at Hargrave, education was everything that I pursued. And I felt within me this really strong leadership calling. Michael put it in the, in the press release for, the, for this lecture tonight that I charted a path for professional leadership and really have felt leadership is my calling. And it's, it's, uh, I'm confident that the good Lord is, has helped bring me to Lise McRae um, with this wonderful institution and the mission it has for, for changing lives and living our motto of in the mountains, of the mountains, and for the mountains. Along this journey of mine, I've learned a couple of lessons. And I continue to learn through the, through the, um, through the as I continue to grow and develop not only as a man, but as a leader. Education changed my life. And the opportunity for an education has absolutely changed my life. And I think it's why I've spent my career in education. Tammy will tell you the time when we were dating, actually we were engaged, and my plan had been to go back to Clifton Fords and work in the bank that Dad had worked in. And we were in a minor league baseball game in Lynchburg, and I said, honey, I think I want to be a teacher. And I think she nearly f fell out of the stands that night at the, uh, at the baseball game as I said that. But it has helped me understand the transforming power of education and what happens when opportunity and education come together. So I've learned some things along our way that I want to share four important lessons with the ladies of the New Opportunity School, and I hope that these will come together for, for others of you that are here listening tonight. So four opportunities, and uh, then I'll sit down and shut up, and we'll, we'll, we'll end this. Number one, seize the new opportunities that you're given. I think it's, it's wonderful that the mission of this organization is the New Opportunity School for Women. 
seize the opportunities that you're given. A couple of years ago, we had a speaker at an event in Hampton, Sydney. His name was Rye Barkai. And Rye is a, uh, had been an uh, executive at Duke Energy, and he runs a nonprofit called Carolina for Cabera. Cabera is a slum in South Africa where Carolina for Cabera is an organization that brings soccer to the slums and teaches, teaches students how to, how to play soccer. It provides them educational opportunities and gives them a leg up. And Rye said something very, very important that fits in with this uh, seize new opportunities. Rye said, and I quote, and I'm sorry, I don't have my glasses, so I need longer arms here. <laughs> talent is universal. Opportunity is not. Everyone has talent. But the opportunities to be able to blend, make that talent into something special are very, very limited for lots of people in the world. So whenever a new opportunity presents itself to you, take it and seize that new opportunity that comes. Second, surround yourself with mentors who will help you along the way. I am where I am today because of wonderful people who have helped invest in me, either as a teacher or as a coach or a, a boss or others. Who, have, who will love you for who you are and will help mold you and make you and guide you along the path that you should go through. Third, find your Micaiah and listen. You know, you wonder who's Micaiah? Well, let me tell you the story of Micaiah. Micaiah is an Old Testament prophet and you can read his story in the book of 1 Kings. And I'll quickly tell you the story of Micaiah. You don't have to be a Christian or, a, or, a, or a, even a believer in the Bible to understand the power of this particular story. But there were two ancient kings. There was King Ahab and King Jehoshaphat. I love that name, Jehoshaphat. It's just the, the, coolest, name, the <laughs> coolest name ever. Jehoshaphat came to visit King Ahab. And as they were talking, Ahab looks at Jehoshaphat and says, this other kingdom over here really is ours, and we should go and seize it. In other words, we should go to war and take this land. And Jehoshaphat was a more careful leader than Ahab. And Jehoshaphat looked at him and said, Okay, I'll give you my, my armies, I'll give you my weapons, but you need to seek the guidance. He said, You need to seek the guidance of the Lord before we agree to do this. Are there people here who can tell you what God might think about this? And they called in 400 prophets, all of whom said, go to war, do this thing. And Jehoshaphat, being very wise, said, don't you have anybody else that may be better tuned in, basically, to get some advice from? And Ahab said, and this is very, very important, Ahab said, there is this one other guy named Micaiah, but he never tells me what I want him to say. <laughs> so they call in Micaiah. Micaiah first lies and says, sure, yeah, go ahead, do it. And Ahab looks at him and says, tell me the truth. Micaiah says, if you go to battle, you're going to die. Don't do it. Ahab looks at Jehoshaphat and says, see, I told you so. This guy never tells me what I want to hear. <laughs> Throw him in jail until I come back. And essentially, Micaiah's words had an impact on Abraham because when they went to battle, Ahab went to battle under disguise. And he ended up getting shot by a wayward arrow because he was sitting out while the battle raged on in front of him. And the story ends there. You never know what happens to Micaiah. Was he, was he left in prison because Ahab didn't come back? But here's the power in that. How many times do we surround ourselves with people who tell us exactly what we want them to say? And how many times do we listen to them? Because we, they are telling us what we want them to say, not what we need to hear. So find your Micaiah and listen. I've told this story as well of our cabinet, our very first cabinet meeting here at Lee McCray a few weeks ago. I want each of you to be my Micaiah. I expect you to tell me when I'm wrong. I expect you to say, that's not wise. I expect you to say, don't go down that path. Because that is very, very important. A leader, should, a leader and a human being should never surround themselves with a complete group of yes people that um, always tell us what we want them to say versus what we need to hear. 
So find your Micaiah and listen. Ahab had a Micaiah, but he was too, too full of himself um, and didn't want to listen. And finally, use your influence. There was a great book that I read last, uh, last spring as I was preparing to come for Lisa McCray. The title of the book was How to Lead When You're Not in Charge. And I thought, that's a perfect book for a college president. <laughs> for those of you that are around, the, have been around college presidents for a while know that the college president is the guy that has the authority and run, is you know, the, the figurehead of the institution, but he is in charge of very little. The faculty are in charge of the curriculum. The trustees are ultimately in charge of the institution, and you're at the whim of lots of different things that are happening. So it's a great story for written for people that are maybe not in positions of extreme authority or ultimate authority, but it tells them how to use the most important thing that each of us have, and that's our influence. And as you start your journey, use the influence you have to help others better understand you, to help better, others better understand the situation. And I look around, I even look around Lisa McCray right now, and I can tell you that some of the most powerful people on this campus are the people that are the administrative assistants, the faculty members and others who use their wisdom and they use their influence to influence the direction and the, and the opportunities that, that we are given. My journey has turned out well because I seized an opportunity with my mother in the ninth grade when I said, I don't want to go to summer school. I want to have this new opportunity to do something different. I hope you will seize the new opportunities that you're given. Sorry. This is probably not good enough for YouTube, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> seize the new opportunities that you're given. Embrace them, grab it, and squeeze all the juice and all the life out of it that you can. Congratulations on working through this program. Sorry, again. Thank you all for being here and listening to this blubber fool. <laughs> Gosh, I promise I'll get much better at this, everybody. This, give me a take two tomorrow night. How about that? We love you, Lee. Thank you. <laughs> but I'm honored that you came out tonight to hear my story and uh, what education did for me. And I hope that not only just the combination of my story, but the four points that I share with you finding a mentor, seizing opportunity, finding your Makai and listening to him or her. The Makai could be her. It often is. It often is. <laughs> Typically we marry. Yes, my name is Makai. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, um, and, and seize those opportunities that come your way. Thank you so much for allowing me to talk with you tonight. I'll be happy to answer any questions if people have questions or We'll stay until we're ready to turn the lights out tonight. Tammy and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm honored that you gave me the opportunity to speak. And uh, I promise next time around you won't, have to, you won't see a, a blubbering guy standing in front of you. As I, uh, but the, the, the personal nature of this story was one that was very important to me, and I thought it was one that was very important to share that uh, hopefully has made an impact on you. And uh, good luck, and thank you again for allowing me to do this tonight. Thank you.